Mmm, the first taste of rare bourbon you finally got your hands on. That's nice. At Caskers.com, we make this experience easy. Caskers is a one-stop spirit curator with an impressive selection of exclusive sought-after rare and household names in the realm of premium spirits and champagne. Discover the top flavors of the year now by going to Caskers.com and using code WELCOME10 for $10 off your first purchase. Get $10 off your first purchase with code WELCOME10 at Caskers.com. Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hey everyone, welcome. I'm Susan Coffin. I'm here for Attitude Magazine's weekly ADHD Experts Live webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a wonderful expert with us, Deborah Reber, who's here to share her thoughts on how to raise an exceptional child, also sometimes referred to as a neurodiverse child in a conventional world. She'll be talking about how to parent your neurodiverse child with confidence, with joy, and with a sense of the future. We are super thrilled to have Deborah Reber speaking today. She is here in New York on a book tour for her new book about parenting atypical or neurodiverse kids. It's called Differently Wired, Raising an Exceptional Child in a Conventional World. It was published in June by Workmen. It's available in bookstores now, and we love you to have a look. From ADHD to autism through learning disabilities and sensory processing, Debbie's book provides guidance for parents of all kinds of neurodiverse children. She, by way of background, is a New York Times bestselling author, speaker, and she's the founder of Tilt Parenting, which is a website, a global online community for parents raising differently wired children. Check out her Tilt Parenting podcast, a top podcast in iTunes, kids, and family category. She lives in Amsterdam with her husband, Darren and homeschools their 13-year-old twice exceptional son, Asher. So, Debbie, thank you so much for being here. We are grateful. Our sponsor today, we're always grateful for our sponsors. They allow us to make these webinars free. Play Attention, it's a leader in neurocognitive training to improve executive function and self-regulation. Play Attention understands fully that having a neurodiverse child doesn't mean they can't learn. It just means they learn differently. So Play Attention customizes each program to specifically address the strengths and weaknesses of the user. They offer a free consultation and they will customize a plan that works for you and your child. So check out Play Attention on their website, playattention.com or call 1-800-788-6786. That's 1-800-788-6786 for information about play attention, neurocognitive training. I'm now going to turn the microphone over to Debbie. Thank you so much again for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. And, uh, you know, I just really appreciate the work of Attitude and the quality of the experts you guys bring in. So I'm really honored to have this opportunity. Um, I know many of your guests are child development gurus and pediatricians and other experts. And I'm not maybe your typical expert, but I am so excited to just share because what I believe so deeply is that we as parents are a critical piece of this equation when it comes to helping our differently wired kids thrive. And, you know, so much of the attention and focus often goes on our kids and getting them the strategies and tools they need to, you know, get through school and navigate their childhood, but it's harder to find material that focuses on our experiences and how we ourselves can actually thrive in this parenting relationship. So that's my goal for today is to, you know, shift the focus from our kids to us and our thinking and our beliefs and just really the way we're dealing with raising a child who may not be the child we expected when we first became parents. So just a little bit about me. I'm the parent of, um, as you said, a 13-year-old twice exceptional boy. He has diagnoses of ADHD and Asperger's. And probably like everyone listening today, when he came into the world, my husband and I were wholly and completely unprepared for what we were in store for. Uh, He was one of those quote unquote highly spirited babies and toddlers. So we kind of knew right away we were engaged in a more extreme form of parenting. Um, you see from the picture here, a wingsuit flyer. I like to call us the wingsuit flyers of parenting because um, it's just a little more intense, extreme sport. Um, 
but for us, it wasn't until preschool that we started realizing that he, you know, our son most likely had some genuine neuro differences and probably like many of the listeners today, it really wasn't easy to know, you know, where to turn for information or help or where to start. But after asking around and doing a lot of online research, our journey looked like getting, uh, getting us placed on a five month long waiting list for an assessment. And when he was uh, five at that first one, he received a provisional diagnosis of ADHD and something else called pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, which some of you may be familiar with. But even despite having that information, we still thought, okay, we're just going to keep moving ahead with our plan. Uh, we were assuming we would be able to pick our neighborhood school and just kind of move along on our journey the way we had expected or the way we saw friends doing. And we were lucky with our preschool that they were supportive of who our son was, um, even though there were a lot of challenges that were starting to come up and a lot of notes home from school and a lot of impromptu after school conferences. Um, but when we got to elementary school, that's when we really started to feel stuck because was really challenging for him. Um, the way that he responded to the structure of school and, of course, what was expected in the classroom was just not a match. So as a parent, I was really struggling. That's when I kind of just started feeling incredibly overwhelmed, finding myself on this path I never intended to be on. I had no idea how to navigate it. I kept looking for answers. I wanted someone to give me, you know, here's what you do. Here's the clear set of rules. Um, here's exactly the kind of support Asher needs. Here's the school that would be perfect. But as you know, if you're going through this, it sometimes can be hard to figure those things out. It can take a lot of time and research and just not knowing how to piece together that plan. And then on top of that, while we're trying to do that work, personally, many of us are just suffering because we're feeling overwhelmed and frustrated and concerned and isolated. I really was struggling to find other families like us who were in the same situation. Um, I wanted strategies. You know, I just wanted some support. Um, so in our school journey, we, we did go through three schools in three years. And we ultimately decided to stop trying to fit, you know, Asher, the round, uh, the square peg kid into the round hole, what existed. And we just kind of took a big step back and said, well, what would best serve and support Asher in tapping into his unique strengths? So we ultimately made the decision to homeschool Asher. And that's what we've been doing now for the past five years. And so in learning how to best support him and meet his needs and also keep our family connected and working, I became really passionate about bringing that awareness to other parents who were in that same position as I was and help them learn how to parent from a place of possibility and feel more confident and optimistic instead of lost and frustrated and um, concerned about the future. So that's what I want to talk with you about today and share some of those thoughts because, as I said in the beginning, I really believe the most powerful thing that we can do for our kids is to work on ourselves. Um, so today I'm going to offer you some, some ideas for how we can actually do that to feel more confident, to feel positive, to feel like we've got this, and to, you know, ultimately be the kind of parents who can best support and see our child for who they are. So I love the poll results um, that that was something that has come up that a lot of a lot of people are looking for how to focus on strengths instead of correction. So hopefully you'll get that out of today. So the first thing that I wanted to share is just some thoughts around even just processing and accepting a kid's diagnosis. Even if the diagnosis happened years ago, I think that, you know, many of us get the news and we're just kind of off to the races, right? We're suddenly like, okay, we have this information. We go down this new path of figuring out, you know, resources or therapies or medications or whatever it is. And we often don't give ourselves time to even take a pause for ourselves. 
And as it turns out, we may have lots of our own complicated emotions mixed up in this diagnosis or, you know, what it means for our kid, for our family. It might trigger fears or concerns in us. Uh, we might think that we are in a place of acceptance, but then something happens that reminds us that, oh, actually, I still have a lot of work to do here, um, or that we're still often fighting with the reality of what's going on with our kids. Or we may even, I've heard this from so many parents, we might blame ourselves for our wiring, um, especially if we ourselves have a similar diagnosis or maybe our pregnancy was strained or we read research that makes us think somehow I caused this to happen. So a lot of what I'm going to be sharing today is about noticing and reflecting. So I'm going to periodically share some questions for reflection because we can't make changes or improve our thinking or beliefs until we get clear and honest about where we are right now. So these questions are designed to kind of prompt you to explore your thoughts and ideas around these concepts. So one question to think about is what aspects of who my child is am I not fully accepting? And this warrants, you know, just taking some time. Uh, we might, as I said, think we're in acceptance and really we have, um, you know, we might still be uh, not, not quite there yet and that disconnect can cause problems. We might also, number two, be um, holding on to some implicit biases about neurodiversity. I struggled with the diagnosis of ADHD and I had to think, why is that? What, what does that mean to me? You know, where is this triggering my own stuff? And then thirdly, in what ways, if any, am I secretly hoping an issue or a trait or aspect of who my child is will eventually go away or that he or she will ultimately become normal? And I think it's really important to think about that um, and really get honest with yourself. So in terms of stop fighting who your child is, this is one way that we can start to come to terms and, and really accept the diagnosis and process that. We want to allow ourselves time to mourn. Um, I don't think mourn is too strong a word to use. A lot of people have been asking me about that in interviews and things, and I think that's fair enough, you know. Um, I don't, I'm not saying our child getting a diagnosis is a terrible thing, uh, but it does mean that the vision we had for our child's future is going to look different. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that and allow ourselves to process all the complicated emotions that come along with it. So I encourage you to just get honest about where you might be experiencing sadness about the way your child's wired and that vision you had about what life for your son or daughter would look like that now feels as if it's completely off course. So we want to acknowledge those feelings because that's how we can actually release them and release their hold over us. And then we also want to recognize where we're fighting reality. So there's a saying I'm just going to quickly share. Um, Byron Katie says, when you argue with reality, you lose, but only 100% of the time. And I love that quote because it's so true. Yet it's something we all do. We tend to argue with reality all the time. But to stop doing that, we have to recognize where we're doing that in our day-to-day -day life. So here's a little strategy for, for tuning in on that. We can keep an ear out for what I call the universal fighting reality cues. And that might be using words like should or shouldn't, you know, such as, uh, you know, he shouldn't uh, be reacting that way or she should be more organized. Um, anytime we're using those words, we are arguing with reality. My husband, uh, Darren, used to say to me, he shouldn't get so angry when it's time to stop playing that game um, or he should just listen to me. And I would say consistently, yes, but he is getting angry or but he's he's not listening to you. You know, that's the truth. Um, so we want to identify those areas because if we stop arguing with reality, then we won't get so upset when what's happening isn't matching our vision. Another piece of honoring our reactions or emotions concerning our kiddos' diagnoses is 
to reframe the way we're thinking about their narrow differences. And for most of us, and again, this ties back to that poll question, this means starting to see through a strengths-based lens. Um, and I know that that's not the way it tends to go for many of us. You know, usually we get the assessment because something wasn't going well or we recognized an area of weakness or a deficit in our child. So it's really important that we take time to refocus the lens and focus on their strengths. And so here are three um, ways to, to start doing that. One is to just notice where you're leading with deficits when you talk about your child with other people. And I will say, personally, this is something I used to be very guilty of. If I was talking with someone who was going to be spending time with my child, like maybe Asher was going on a play date or something, I felt this sense of responsibility to basically give them a checklist of all his difficult behavior, which I was leading with his deficits. You know, this can be hard for him, games he can get really upset, or he can talk really loud, or whatever it is. So by doing that, I was emphasizing a deficits-based way of seeing him and the way he responds to the world, which doesn't only, if, if you do this, you know it affects how others perceive our child. It also prevents us from truly seeing and appreciating and nurturing our kids' strengths. So we want to notice that and then learn how to talk about our child in terms of their strengths and lead with that. So in my example, I just shared, you know, I could say, yeah, Asher's really enthusiastic, <laughs> you know, he's always got lots of ideas and sometimes he brings his creativity to games, which can be really interesting. You know, there's just ways that we can look at the gifts that come with this and shift it around so we're not leading with the challenges. The, um, the next thing is to pay attention to how much energy we are spending trying to quote unquote fix uh, deficits rather than supporting and growing their strengths. So this is related to the last bullet point, but it's also becoming aware of your intentions and motives behind what you're working on with your child. So, you know, are we working on things with them or getting them therapy or tools so they can be more quote unquote normal or are we doing it to help them become more successful in their lives? I know for me, I really was trying, I was thinking, okay, if we can address this, this, and this, then he can just shift back into this normal path. Um, but in doing that, I was viewing all his challenges or his differences as deficits that I needed to fix. And so I had to really let that go. Um, our kids internalize those messages, right? Uh, when we are focusing on their lagging skills all the time, they will internalize the message that there's something wrong with them and it will also really get in the way of their growing and nurturing their strengths. So we want to make sure there's a balance there. Um, actually, we want to make sure we're spending a lot more time on the strengths than the deficit. So just notice that. I talked with um, an executive functioning coach who said, you want to do five positive reinforcements for every one negative. And I love that ratio. I'm not even close to there yet, but I'm working on it. And I think it's a nice um, benchmark to keep in mind. And then lastly, on this slide, developing a sound bite that reframes the way you introduce your child, emphasizing his or her strengths. So again, just to make this easier for us to do, I recommend actually writing out a script the way you might, if you're uh, in business and you have to pitch something, you know, the way you might pitch a, an idea or introduce yourself at a networking event or something, write a script that feels positive and true for who your child is of how you would introduce them to someone new and practice it so you can confidently deliver it when you're introducing your child and write it in a way that emphasizes their strengths and, and it, it will just change the way that your child is perceived from the get-go. So the next strategy, or actually call these tilts, in my book I break down um, 18 tilts because they are little shifts or tilts in our perspective or thinking. Um, so the next one here is to parent from a place of possibility instead of fear. So what does that mean? Um, I don't know if this is the case for you, but in raising my son, with every passing year, 
I felt increasingly limited by our options and fear was just taking a playing a bigger and bigger role in my life. You know, what would happen if we chose the wrong school or got the wrong diagnosis or all those what ifs, right? The future what ifs um, were keeping me up at night. But I also learned the hard way that living a life driven by fear is really painful. It's not where we want to be, um, even though it is the norm for so many of us. I hear this from a lot of parents that this is kind of their, their MO, you know, when they're feeling stuck and overwhelmed. But the problem when we do that is we're basically equating our child with their diagnosis rather than seeing them as the creative, amazing humans they are who, who are here to shake up the world. You know, when we're choosing fear instead of possibility, that actually keeps us stuck by contributing to anxiety in our families, which affects the way our kids who are already maybe anxious or more sensitive feel about themselves. And we're just, um, we're creating like a self-fulfilling prophecy of uh, fearful energy um, that's going to have a trickle down effect in a negative way. So just like we did before, here are a couple of questions to reflect on, to think about this, um, this concept and the role that possibility and fear might be playing in your life. So the first is, To ask yourself, do I make decisions from a place of fear or possibility, both in my life at large and in my life with my child? So just taking a step back and thinking about that. What is my motivation when I'm making a choice about my child's school or maybe my job or where we live or whatever decision, what we're doing for takeout, whatever whatever decision you're dealing with? Um, The second, how might fear be holding me back? from making decisions that could benefit or better support my child. So fear is an incredible motivator, right? It, um, it feels safer somehow uh, to choose fear because it feels more known. Sometimes going out on a limb can feel scarier, but this is a good one to think about. And then how might my concerns about the future be unhelpful in the way I'm parenting my child and the choices I make? So to parent in possibility, Instead of fear, I will say it is possible, um, but it does require being truly intentional and making conscious choices to parent from this place. So here are three of my suggestions for doing that. The first is to just get real about your fears, get it all out on the table. The clearer that we can get on our fears, the more able we'll be to see um, how they're impacting our life and they'll start to lose their influence uh, in our life. So, you know, think about those irrational, worst case scenario fears about what might happen or maybe what might not happen uh, for our child. I think sometimes think that we want to not dwell on fear and that avoiding it is the way to go. But I know that when we actually acknowledge those fears and let them have their, their say, um, we can actually um, start to take away the power they have over us. We also want to think about the language we use. Um, We all know that language uh, can influence our experience and how we feel. It's one of the reasons why I use the term differently wired, um, which feels positive and curious and interesting to me as opposed to so much of the deficits or disorder or epidemic or whatever other medicalized or language that we hear so much. So we want to, um, instead of talking about how concerned we are or worried we are, I love the word curious. You know, my son's in camp right now. I'm, you know, I could say I'm really worried about him. He's there for 18 days. What if this happens? What if that happens? And I'm choosing to switch the script and say, I'm so curious to know what's going to happen. I'm so curious to know if he's going to make any friends. You know, maybe this is going to be a transformative experience for him. So just start to recognize the language you're using because it will shift your experience if you can start using more optimistic words. And then lastly here, trusting your ability to know what your child needs. I think when we're really consumed with fear and worrying about those what ifs, we're putting ourselves down. We're um, making ourselves not out, out to be as capable as we really are. Um, so I just want to 
remind you that you, all of you listening to this uh, webinar, are creative and resourceful and committed to parents and that you do have what it takes to ensure your child gets what he or she needs at every stop along the way. So the next tilt I wanted to share is just helping your child embrace self-discovery and self-knowledge. I believe one of the greatest gifts we can give our differently wired kids is that knowledge of who they are, how their brain works, and what they need to do to create the life that they want. Because when we can do this and really guide them along that self-discovery path, they can start to feel really good about themselves and develop self-advocacy skills and ultimately grow up to be self-actualized adults, which is, I think, the goal for all of us. So here are some reflection questions to um, spend some time thinking about maybe after the webinar um, and go into a little deeper. So am I actively fostering and modeling a culture of self-discovery in our family? Um, that's something that we can do by doing our own work here. Uh, am I regularly sharing insights for my child about his or her neuro differences in a way that encourages reflection and self-awareness? And I'll talk about that um, in another minute. And then lastly, do I handle difficult situations or challenges in a way that focuses on helping my child learn more about who they are rather than punishing them or addressing the behavior only? So think, uh, spend time thinking about those and getting honest with, with what this actually looks like in your family. So how do we do this? How do we support our child's self-discovery? Um, first, we want to use language that supports and not shames. And this is pretty straightforward, and I know it seems simple, but I don't think the importance of this can be understated, um, especially because so many of our kids are in a position where they are actively identifying as the bad kid. I know my son did for many years. He was the bad kid because he got, he spent a lot of time with the principal, we'll just say, um, because of his behavior in school. They may have low self-esteem and they may be really sensitive to perceived criticism. So we have to kind of walk that fine line between addressing areas for growth honestly and respectfully and logically, but in a way that emphasizes that there's nothing wrong, but that we are working towards a solution with our child. So we can do that by validating their emotions and empathizing, you know, um, if we're talking with them about something uh, that they're working on, we can say, you know, oh, I could see you're feeling embarrassed by this conversation. I know how that feels. That can be really uncomfortable. This is really hard stuff to talk about. So just empathizing with them. We can give them space and not force the issue. So, you know, if they're really just not in the mood to hear it, just saying, you know, I can tell you're not in the mood to talk about this right now. That's totally fine. Let's circle back when you're ready. Um, so just giving them that space. And then, of course, we don't want to bring up challenges in difficult moments. <laughs> we want to wait till the storm has calmed and we can, uh, we can both have time to be in a better space and um, we can just look at things without the emotions attached to it. But the consistent message we want our kids to hear in every conversation that touches upon their challenges is that there is nothing wrong with you you know, we can say we're all working on things. Um, that's part of being human. Um, and the great thing is once we know how our brains operate, we can support ourselves in making things easier for, for us. And we're, it's work we're all doing. The next thing is remembering that everything is an opportunity for growth. And when I say that, I mean everything, even the really hard stuff, um, the bad days, the screw-ups, you know, on both of our parts. So, you know, our job as these kids' parents is really looking for opportunities to help our kids make connections between their thoughts, their feelings, and their actions by regularly asking questions of them or making observations to them about what we're seeing. And when we do that, our kids will start to recognize the value in reflecting and identifying their personal roadblocks, and they'll learn their own strategies. So... Here's just what that might sound like. Um, you know, I noticed your homework went more smoothly when you had a snack before you started. Or 
Have you noticed getting out the door for school at the end of the week is much harder than at the beginning of the week? Do you have any ideas about why that might be? So anytime something big comes up, it's just always remembering, okay, great. This is shining a spotlight on uh, an area of lagging skills or something we need to work on. What can my child learn from this and how can I help him or her get there? And then lastly, modeling self-discovery. Um, you know, we can do this by being curious about ourselves and doing the work in our own lives to figure out our own processes and strengths and weaknesses and talking about it out loud. Um, you know, let our kids know what we're working on, explain to them how it gets in our own way and what we're doing about it. That is so powerful. Our kids are watching everything we do even and paying attention even when we think they're not. Um, us modeling that kind of thing can have a really um, big impact. So the last tilt that I wanted to share with you before we go to questions is um, about shifting mindsets, thoughts, and actions. So I'm a big believer in the idea that one of our biggest jobs of parenting these unique kids, especially if our goal is to get to a place of peace and acceptance about who they are, is to question everything in our lives as parents from parenting philosophies to the kinds of characteristics and traits we value to education to nutrition because until we honestly examine how we think and feel about every aspect of raising our differently wired kids, we will subconsciously be seeing everything through this outdated lens of, you know, trying to fit the square peg kid into the round hole and that is not going to serve our children. We're going to keep trying to adapt and change them rather than leaning into who they are. And I am a deep believer in the idea that there's no one way that this parenting journey has to look for anyone. Uh, that's especially true for those of us raising kids who have neurological differences. So when we start questioning all those assumptions and ideals, we will start to feel happier and freer about what's possible for our child. Um, it's not something I will say that, can, that happens overnight, um, embodying this questioning mindset, but it gets easier with practice. So the reflection questions for this tilt are, how willing am I to question my ideas of what I expected my child's life to look like? That is a biggie. I will just say the more work you can do in this area, the better. And really getting, you know, honest with yourself about what I thought this was going to look like. Um, next, where am I regularly coming up against my own parenting expectations not meshing with our current reality? And then how might my beliefs about the way things should look, and there's that word should again, be keeping me stuck? So... To shift our thinking, here are three things that you can start working on now. Um, the first is getting out of limited thinking. We need to, as I said before, get honest with ourselves about the beliefs we are holding on to for what our child's life should look like. Um, actually, I recommend just getting rid of the word should from your vocabulary altogether. Um, there's a disconnect anytime we're using that between our thinking and reality. Uh, so we want to just start paying attention to that language um, and then challenge. When you find yourself using that language, challenge those thoughts and try to flip them around and think about, you know, why those shoulds or those have tos or need tos might not actually be true. Then we want to imagine what could be. This one's kind of fun because it's about imagining that anything is possible. You know, there's that question, if you knew you could succeed, what would you do? Um, as a career or in life. And we can ask the same thing for with our kids. If we knew we would be successful in doing something for our child, what would it look like? So we want to consciously set aside time to explore this. You know, what would an ideal day or life in a perfect world look like for our child with them being wired exactly how they are? Um, we can start to um, discover in doing that or at least start to crack open the window of what might be possible um, when we start opening up our imagination and start considering, hmm, maybe there is another way this could look. How could I bring a little bit more of that into my life? 
And then lastly, we want to fill our inspiration bucket. Um, I just wanted to leave you with this one last thought because I know that raising these atypical kids requires bravery because we're essentially going down uncharted territory in many ways, you know, and, and to do the work that I've been sharing with you today, we have to admit something isn't working and we have to accept the idea that we need to make some changes. Um, and that requires bravery. I hear this from all the parents I, I talk to and I get emails from um, who are doing this this hard, brave work. So I just wanted to share one of my personal strategies for getting more comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, And that is to get inspired by stories of people who are breaking the rules and forging their own paths. I found that when we engage in stories that inspire us and we commit to regularly asking and honestly answering the question, you know, how am I willing to forge my own path? in support of my differently wired child, we can begin to see that what's possible is actually much greater than we may ever have imagined. So that wraps up what I had to formally share with you um, today, but I would love to answer some questions. I'm so curious to hear um, what's on people's minds. Thank you so much, Debbie. That was fascinating. I'll just start off by saying I was really struck by your comment about Um, making sure that your child always knows that nothing, quote, is wrong with you. And Mm -hmm. it strikes me um, how difficult it is to balance um, getting your child help without this constant helping (laughs) being perceived as as fixing. And I, I find that I found that balance extremely difficult. And I think we oftentimes gave our daughter the sense that we were trying to fix her. On the other hand, she needed the help and and oftentimes asked for it. Do you have any further advice on that really difficult balancing act? It is a tricky balancing act. I will absolutely agree Um, because we want our kids' self-esteem to stay intact. We want them to feel confident about who they are while also helping them recognize that, you know, there are, and this is what I say to my son, you know, this particular, whatever the behavior is or something is actually something that could create some challenges for you in the world because there are certain expectations that people have around this particular situation. And you should be aware that if you choose to do it this way, you may have a harder time achieving your goals or Mm -hmm. making the mark you want to make on the world. So I try to phrase it that way. Um, Sometimes he says, well, why do I need to change? You know, (laughs) it's not my, you know, but it's more of like there, this is the society we live in. And there are some things that you'll want to consider in order for you to be able to make your biggest mark on the world. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting way to put it. Yeah. And we're not trying to fix you. We're trying to give you tools to go exactly. to go forward. Yeah. So um, some questions here. <laughs> um, how do we help the world understand our children better? And that subsidiary question here, someone asked if your husband used the word should and you were pointing out to him that that might not be the way to go. How do you How do you, even in your own family, work with family members who may not see your child as having the strengths that you see them having? Uh, Well, just to answer the first part, um, how do we get the world to shift their thinking? Um, I think that we as parents of, of these kids are in such a great position to compassionately educate other people. And I always use compassion in there because a lot of people just don't get our kids um, or they mm-hmm. see what's going on with them as behavioral only. Um, I really think that when we talk openly and matter of factly about who our child is or what's happening with them, we'll start to erase the stigma. We'll start to expand awareness. I I believe in transparency because I think that also helps to just raise awareness across the board. Um, So, and and just getting to the second part of the question about um, that word should and even within the family. Yeah, it's really tricky. Um, Families can be difficult. Um, You know, I think I, you know, for, for me with a Darren, uh, 
I just say that to all the time. I just kind of like, yes, and this is what's actually happening. You know, it's just a, it's just an ongoing conversation. I think it can be really tricky with extended family who don't, mm-hmm. um, who may have judgments, right, about right. what we're doing, or may think that we're under parenting, or or maybe helicopter parenting our child. So, um, right. part of it is us just kind of being being in a strength in our knowing that we are doing, we're putting our child first in what he or she needs. Um, and then just compassionately trying to bring everybody up to speed. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, it's, it's really difficult. It's an interesting question here about um, um, how to respond when my child, and when I correct my child for something and he says, well, I can't help it. That's just the way my brain works. So it sounds like she's been mm-hmm. su- successful in um, telling her child that he has a different brain. How to respond to my nine-year-old when we correct this behavior and he says, that's just how my brain works. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. These <laughs> kids are so smart. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I, I, I'm a fan of really getting into brain science and talking about neuroplasticity, like on a kid level um, and letting them know, yeah, I know this can be extra challenging for you. This is something that I know doesn't come as naturally to you. And it's something that um, we're going to keep working on because it's going to make your life easier. Um, I think it's a fine line um, of uh, I hear this a lot from parents about their kids maybe using certain things as an excuse. Um, mm-hmm. it's, and, and I think it's something to be aware of, but it's also helping our child develop a growth mindset and also knowing that um, they, they actually can have a lot of control, um, not control and that they can sit still, that, that kind of control, but that they, um, they're the captain of their ship, right? And they um, can learn more about who they are and the brain is a, a growing, evolving organ and we can, we can continue to, to change the way that it interacts with the world. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, there are a number of questions here relating more or less to the topic of how to explain to others your child's strengths, both at school and people around them, as opposed to leading with deficits. I think the number of people saying, gee, I realized from listening to this that I am leading with my child's deficits Mm -hmm. in in an attempt to explain to those working with him. um, Can you give some examples of how to conversations one might have with a coach or a teacher um, that would? Yeah. Yeah, I I mean I I did this all the time. I will just say I I always cuz I was so so overwhelmed with the challenges that I just felt like it was my duty and responsibility to tell everybody and I didn't even realize like oh my gosh, mm-hmm. this is the lead of the story here and that is so unfair cuz it's uh it's just who would want that? I mean, turn it around and think if someone introduced you <laughs> like that. Right, and, right. This is Debbie. She's a really anally attentive and she will remake the bed and, you know, whatever. Like, you just don't want that. Um, yeah, I think what I said earlier about, like, really, like, thinking, think about the different situations where you are having to introduce your child, whether it's at a parents for a play date or a new coach for a sports team or something, and get clear on your story, right? Get clear on, A, how much information you want to share, um, what your intention is in sharing it is if your intention is to support the other person working with your child, that's great. Um, If it's uh, to help your child be more successful, that's great. So thinking about those intentions, pre-write, I'm a big fan of getting ahead of the game and write out, you know, what could I say that would really just capture on their strengths and say, hey, you know, and it might just be like, I just want you to be aware that, um, thinking about a positive, you know, I'm just thinking if, if Asher played soccer, which he used to a long time ago, Asher really loves soccer. He's a really good teammate. Um, and he loves being on the field with other people. Sometimes he can get a little distracted by other things going on and sometimes struggles to, um, to stick with the game, but he could always, if you do that, you know, and give him some strategies, but if you kind of do this, this or this, then you can loop him right back in. And he's so enthusiastic. It's infectious or Mm -hmm. whatever, you know, all our kids have incredible strengths. So, but I really do recommend thinking about the different situations and then coming up with a script, literally a script that you could memorize. Um, 
just like you might an introduction if you're an introvert. You have to memorize how you're going to introduce yourself at an event. Right. It's um, a really good idea, the that. idea of writing yeah. out the script. Yeah. Yep. The ele- sort of elevator speech about my child. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I yeah. mean, many questions again along this lines. One person, um, Danielle, how do you know when or if to share your child's diagnosis with mm-hmm. parents of your child's friends, especially after an awkward social incident? So, yeah. you know, those things happen. And, mm-hmm. you know, what should you say? It's a, uh, this is a really tricky one, I think. Um, Again, I talked about that I'm I'm a proponent of transparency uh, mm-hmm. and honesty, and we need to also feel emotionally safe. So, I I say um, do things on a need to know basis. If you feel safe with the other adult, and I'm talking about emotionally safe, that they're not gonna right. um, you're not gonna feel like crap after that interaction, and like oh my gosh, I just threw my kid under the bus, or they're judging me, or whatever. Um, but if it feels safe. And, um, and it feels like it would be helpful information, then share it. If it feels like you're just saying it, um, to explain something, but they're not really going to get it, then I don't know that it's, it's worth going there if it's going to leave you feeling bad about it. Right. Yeah. Interesting comment from someone in response to the person who, the, the person whose child responded by saying, you know, I can't help it. My, that's the way my brain works. She suggested saying to him, tell me more <laughs> as an mm-hmm. opportunity to see his perspective. <laughs> so that was an interesting thing. That. <laughs> that was great. And someone yeah. else, people always have such wonderful comments. My child's therapist introduced him to rock brain when he is stuck on something and how he can overcoming it overcome it by bringing in Captain Flex. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that's really cute. That's great. Here's a question on um, how um, older children, my older children, uh, I can under, under, I, I can relate to this question. Um, I struggle with my older children understanding their younger brother's symptoms. Any advice? These mm-hmm. same notion, notions of compassions and letting go of shoulds really also relate to siblings, right? And, and family members as much as they do us as parents. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in the, you know, and I only have one child, um, so I don't have that particular dynamic in my home, but I talked to lots of experts and, and read, um, books on this. Um, but from my understanding is that just making sure the family feels like they're working to support each other, you know, making sure every kid and, and the family knows that we're all working on different things, uh, whether you have a diagnosis or not. And so just really, becoming aligned and in, in supporting um, areas of deficit and liking skills for each other and so that you can work to support each other. Mm-hmm. So having a family culture, I think that that where everyone understands that they're supporting each other in whatever path mm-hmm. they're on, mm-hmm. as opposed to one, mm-hmm. perhaps one child being the, the non-typical kid. child, yeah. the problem <laughs> child, everybody else being the, yeah, yeah. that's a, yeah. Yeah, oh, absolutely. this question here's from Angie comes up all the time. And I really, I, I relate to this, Angie. How can you differentiate bad behavior from behavior resulting from ADHD? That's a bit back to the, when is an excuse and when is it a reality that we need to recognize? Um, yeah, I will share just something that I wrote in the book. And, you know, my kid also has Asperger um, as a diagnosis. And I was talking with his therapist and I asked the exact question because it frustrated me. Or just, I was like, what is what? Like, what's going on here? And he (laughs) said to me, I said, what's the behavior and what's his Asperger's? And he said, well, Debbie, he always has Asperger's. So that's always going to be a contributing factor to the behavior. You can't separate the child from the diagnosis. So even if it's, that's not a blanket excuse for anything, but just to recognize that, you know, I believe that what Dr. Ross Green says, that kids do well when they can. And if there is a problem mm-hmm. or behavioral challenge, it's because they don't have the skills to do something different yet. So right. um, we need to recognize that and look at that behavior as some kind of information about something that they don't have the tools for yet. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. So the the assumption of positivity that children prefer to behave mm-hmm. well than not, as opposed to yeah. they're sort of arbitrarily. Yeah. Um, interesting yeah. question. This person says, I'm stuck on the fact that my 12 year old needs to get to bed earlier to get the sleep he needs, but he's a night owl. No matter what mm-hmm. we do, even if he goes to bed at 730, he won't go to, to sleep until midnight. How do I accept his natural rhythm, given that he needs to get up for school 
um, but knowing that he needs sleep for his health. So there's a, you know, really nitty gritty example of how you accept your child the way they are, but don't <laughs> or, or can't for whatever reason. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and the bedtime battles are, oh I mean, my gosh, I, I yeah. feel you. I'm in the same boat. I, I mean, my kid also, he just can't shut off his brain and we, he used to take melatonin, but he wanted to stop that a few years ago. And, um, we tried everything from warm baths and meditation and breathing exercises and all mm. kinds of stuff. Um, I think, uh, it, there's a little bit of trust, a leap of faith that knowing that eventually our kids are going to figure this out. Ultimately, they're going to be responsible for their own rhythms and cycles. So the best right. that I can do is give him tools, um, keep seeing if he needs help or if he's willing to try something else to see that might help him relax and calm down. Um, but trying to look at them also as as autonomous beings and knowing that ultimately um, they're going to be responsible for their body. So we can help, but we can't force these issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, number of people who are coping with discipline, um, beyond discipline, but um, ODD behavior, aggression, aggression nastiness mm -hmm. in the household, any mm -hmm. thoughts on, on those kinds of struggles? This is Ross Green's yeah. forte, right? Yeah. I uh, I mean, and Asher used to have a diagnosis of, I think it was disruptive behavioral disorder, which is like ODD, um, mm -hmm. and used to have really, really intense, um, big, tough behavior. Um, you know, my only thought or what I would share right now is just that it's also just so important for you as a parent to make sure that you're taking care of yourself, because when that's directed at us, that is so incredibly challenging. Right. So, you know, of course, I'm a fan of having a plan for how you're going to respond when that happens so that you don't have that deer in headlights look and you, you know, mm -hmm. it's when, when we're not expecting it, that we tend to lose our cool and things really spiral out of control. So as much as you can like have a plan for what you're going to do, if your child does something big or uh, destructive or super intense, um, but then also just making sure to have a recovery plan for yourself um, so that you are restoring because that is really, I, I know from many years of experience, it takes a toll on you and it's really painful to go through. Yeah, it's really tough. Yeah. Th those are the toughest, I think, people that we hear from here at Attitude, you know, who are mm -hmm. really coping with a serious aggression at home from yeah. their children. Yeah. Um, so uh, the idea of doing a better job of giving positive feedback or, or, or praise as opposed to constantly being negative. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to do that? One person here suggested, made a specific uh, suggestion, which was to put five rubber bands on the, on your arm. And every time you do a, make a positive statement to your child, you move one to the other hand. So, you, so it's an interesting technique, but do you have any um, <laughs> thoughts on how to, tip that balance toward positivity. I think we all um, love, definitely yeah. struggle with that. Yeah. I love that rubber band idea. That's, That's an idea, right? Cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think um, it really does require like an intention, maybe even setting an intention every morning that I'm going to really try to look for the bright spots. And I mm -hmm. recognize that sometimes they're really hard to find. And, and also we don't want to be giving our kids fake praise because they can spot right. that a mile away and it's not useful. But um, I go way out of my way to look for just even the littlest, littlest thing. Like, oh my gosh, I just noticed, I noticed you washed your oatmeal bowl out without me having to remind you. How did you do that? How did you remember? <laughs> what was your, you know, I, like just the littlest things. And now when I say something like that, he'll be like, oh, I thank you. Like I can see him stand <laughs> up taller. So it's really, it can be the littlest thing. It doesn't have to be a right. big thing. So you have to really pay attention to catch them doing something that you can acknowledge an area of growth. That's, that's really good. One person says that she and her husband have struggled with very, very, a great deal of difficulty with school and they are considering homeschooling with some trepidation. And she wonders if you could talk a bit about how you made that decision and which is a very big one, how, how you came to that decision and um, how, she, how you maintain your son's social 
connections when he's homeschooled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say I was a reluctant homeschooler. So it was suggested to me probably for two years that I homeschool him. And I was like, that is not happening on my watch. I was not interested. But, um, you know, after realizing in a couple of different schools and just seeing the toll on Asher of and him identifying as the bad kid and his anxiety was ratcheted up, um, I ultimately was like, okay, he deserves something better. So we made the decision um, and it was rough. I will be honest, that first year was really, really challenging. I worked with an educational, like a curriculum advisor who helped mm-hmm. me even just set up the school. Um, but I also needed a lot of support for myself um, in the form of a parent coach just to help me deal with all the the wear and tear, you know, emotional right. wear and tear and the stress. Um, in terms of just to answer the last piece, the social piece, um, you know, I will say doing homeschooling in the Netherlands, which is where I homeschool, has been tricky because there isn't a big community here or there. But in the U.S., um, there, you know, I talk to the homeschoolers all over the country, and in most um, places, it seems like there are really thriving communities and co-ops and all kinds of oh my ways gosh. to yeah. connect with other kids. So. Um, Asher does a lot of his connection virtually, but it's still live virtual with other kids. He's got, he's got friends everywhere. Um, so it's definitely possible. It, it looked, you know, here's what I'll say that I think in our minds, we have this picture that a kid's social life has to look a certain way. And that's, you know, hanging out in the lockers or a hallway or at the lunch, the cafeteria, whatever, and all of that interaction. And I would just say question whether or not that's really true. Is that really true? Does your kid really need that level of social engagement to be a socially adjusted Mm -hmm. person? Mm -hmm. You know? Right. Yep. Yep. All right. Last question. We're out of time. And I think this is a wonderful one. This is from Ina, who says, thank you so much for your insights. I realize that most of my challenges with my son come from my own expectations of what a mother needs to instill in her child. I expected Mm -hmm. for myself excellence, politeness, diplomacy, social acceptance. I'm not sure how to break the chains of my own expectations. What Mm -hmm. are my first steps? (laughs) Listening to this well, webinar. Yes, yeah. I mean, them. even yeah. just acknowledging, even acknowledging, okay, the, this is the whole vision I had. These are the values that I want my child to have. All of those things. Just acknowledge, okay, that's what I thought. And then starting to really look at your kid as their own, as I said this before, their own autonomous being on their own journey. And our mm-hmm. job is to help them be their best selves. And I, you know, for Asher, he didn't display much empathy as a younger kid and mm-hmm. uh, or compassion. And those are my highest values. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, my goodness, I'm raising <laughs> this kid who completely doesn't represent who I am or what I believe in. And I just continued to model it. I stopped trying to make him be something and he, he sees it and he is now one of the most empathetic, compassionate wow. people I know. So, That's wonderful. you know, acknowledge it, let it go and just continue to model, um, who you, who you are in the world and your values as a family and emphasize those and give your child time to catch up. That's a great, great ending. Thank you so much, Deborah. I'm going to go out and buy your book myself right away because <laughs> I think everything you've said here is so valuable and so infrequently said. So thank you. And thanks to everybody listening in for your great questions as well. Thanks, Deborah, And bye, everyone. For more Attitude podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G dot com. You love podcasts. The stories, the laughs, the unexpected turns. But when this episode ends, the silence starts. Not anymore. Audiobooks.com turns that silence into your next great adventure. With over 450,000 titles, from bestsellers to hidden gems, your love for listening just found its new best friend. And because you already know the joy of audio, we're giving you three free audiobooks to start your journey. Imagine your favorite podcast, now with unlimited episodes. That's audiobooks.com. Keep the story going. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. Because for podcast lovers like you, the end of an episode is just the beginning.
That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E.